Well, welcome to At The Cross Live. We're so glad that you're with us. Thank you for spending time with us. It's going to be a great program. Last week, we, we did last time we met, we, we did What Does The Cross Mean To You? And, and this week, we're doing What Does Jesus Mean To You? What Does Jesus Mean To You? And our scripture text is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16 and verses 13 to 18. It says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Verse 18, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks, Lord, for who you are. Lord, in the midst of all that we're going through, Father, you are the one rock that we can count on, we can rest upon, Lord. And Lord, as we, as we talk about you today, Lord, we ask, Father, reveal yourself to us. There, there are some that are watching that, Lord, that needs a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord, speak through my lips today, Father. And Lord, move upon hearts, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, who is Jesus, and what does he mean to you? Uh, this is probably the most important question in the world. The question was so important that Jesus even asked the question of his own disciples. In a sense, he is asking it of, of all of us. There are, there are so many portraits of Jesus in the galleries of this world that it seems hopeless to clarify the confusion that they're formed in the minds of people uh, about who Jesus Christ is. You see, over time, much has been written about this person known as Jesus both from the Bible and numerous other historical sources that refer to him. So it wouldn't be an overstatement to say that the person in history, no person in history, has provoked as much study or, or criticism or prejudice or devotion as Jesus of Nazareth. Best, best selling author Tim LaHaye, he writes this. He says, almost everyone who has heard of Jesus has developed an opinion about him. That is to be expected. He is not only the most famous person in the world history, but also the most controversial. The Bible, however, contains the most information about Jesus. As a matter of fact, the New Testament writers are the primary sources of our knowledge of Jesus. They give us a first-hand I witness account of his life and his ministry. 
these you see are the testimonies of those who knew him and, and loved him and gave their lives for him. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Peter, you know, the Apostle Peter, he wrote in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, he says, we are not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. But you know what? Whether you are Christian or not, though you may not have an exhaustive knowledge of the biblical Jesus, you're not ignorant of him either. You see, the writers of Scripture invite us to examine this person for this person Jesus for ourselves and to conclude for ourselves his significance. There, there are some who see Jesus as only a man. Yeah, a, a good man maybe or, or, or a noble man. Uh, maybe even a highly uh, a, a spiritual man. But, you know, for example, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he called him the man without fault. The historian, Joseph Renan, said he's the greatest among the sons of men. And, and the French philosopher, Diderot, he said, he was the unsurpassed. And Napoleon, he called him the emperor of love. Well, all of those are fine. <laughs> but none of them quite measure up to the biblical account. You see, a recurring theme in the Gospels is always that Jesus is God. Always. He's no mere man. He's not just the best of men. He is God in a body. God come in human flesh. Uh, the theologian Thomas Schultz, Thomas Schultz, he wrote, he says, he says, no one, not one recognized religious leader, not Moses, not Paul, not Mohammed, not Confucius, etc., as ever, listen to this, claimed to be God. That is, with the exception of Jesus Christ. Christ is the only religious leader who claimed to be to have to be deity. And uh, and 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 he says there is the only individual ever listen to this, that has convinced a great portion of the world that he is God. End quote. But watch this. Even if you're not, even if you're an atheist, you're not a Christian, <laughs> you're an atheist, you need to ponder who this Jesus Christ I don't believe in. Who is he? Is he the Christ portrayed by the critics or the cynics? Was he just a wonderful prophet? Was he just a great godly man, as so many others claim to be? Or is Jesus who he claimed to be, God in human form? And, and not only that, he claimed to be the only way to have a relationship with the Father God. Think about that. Now, do you believe that or do you reject that? Because there are no other options that you have. Let me ask you, aren't you tired of the Christ created to squeeze into some philosopher's pattern or, you know, a recycled Christ, a Christ of compromise without any divine power and any power to redeem 
you or me from from our sin and our failure uh, and from the fires of hell so this morning I want us to examine the real Jesus Christ what is it about this man Jesus that so fascinates and mystifies people and 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 why doesn't this why doesn't this memory just fade away <laughs> like that of so many others who were so significant in their time so take a walk with me. Take a walk with, with, with me. And, and see what the Bible says about him from our scripture text. Here's where we're going. We'll be looking at three things. Number one, the great question. Number two, the great answer. And number three, the great promise. So let's look at it. Look at it together. Point number one. The great question. The great question. Look at me again in Matthew. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. It says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? You see, Jesus had withdrawn from the crowds to be alone with his disciples. He, he was facing the end very, very soon. Jesus did not ask this question because he didn't know who he was or because he had an unfortunate dependence on the opinion of others. You see, you see the way a person answers this crucial question determines where he or she will spend eternity either with God in heaven or apart from God in hell now I want to develop this point further by giving you three sub points three sub points uh, so so let's look at them sub point a sub point a notice the significance of the place where he asked the question the significance of the place it was Caesarea Philippi this was about 25 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee the city was was very ancient and, and for centuries it was called Panium Panium, because it was the center of worship of the Greek god Pan. Pan, P-A-N. A son of Herod the Great named Philip. He rebuilt the city and renamed it in honor of the Roman emperor and himself. It then became the center of worship of Caesar Augustus Caesar Augustus as a matter of fact there was a great temple of white marble built to honor Caesar I, I, I want you to see this I want you to see this in a place where pagan worship has become the accepted practice that's the place where Jesus challenged his disciples to consider the crucial question of his own identity. So point B. Notice, notice the significance of the occasion that Jesus asked the question. You see, some of his disciples had left Jesus and John. In John chapter 6 and verse 53, John 6 and verse 53, it says, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You see, besides the 12 main disciples, Jesus had many 
other disciples also, but their, their faith, it was weak and shallow, and, 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 and Jesus was demanding that they follow him with their whole heart. Uh, they were not prepared to do that. It was some of these disciples who began to say, this is a hard teaching. What they, what they meant was, this teaching about eating Jesus' flesh is hard for us to accept. So what did they do? They just quit. They quit. Also, the cross was before him with all of its horrors. Think about it. Think about it. Jesus' humanity in some sense, must have wrestled against his divine mission. Uh, how do we know that? Because his statement in, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41, he said, you remember, the spirit is willing. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. This is most likely a reference to the fact that his flesh, his humanity, was crying out against the coming agony of the cross. But, but more importantly, Jesus wanted to know, and here we come to sub-point C, he wanted to know the depth of the disciples' faith. The depth of the disciples' faith. Somebody says, that faith is like a toothbrush. Everybody should have one and use it regularly, but it isn't safe to use somebody else's. <laughs> it's true. In other words, we can follow men and women of faith and share their exploits, but we can't succeed in our own personal lives by depending on somebody else's faith. My friend, God will test your faith, and he will test my faith. Why, why is that? Well, he wants to show us whether our faith is real or counterfeit. Maybe, maybe God is testing your faith right now. Maybe it's through a delayed promotion or, or an unreached goal or, or through a broken relationship. Or, or by the loneliness you're experiencing by being separate from, separated from loved ones during this pandemic. In other words, he, he, he allows life's uncertainties to invade our lives. You see, the test of faith is not just merely in trusting, but in trusting God when all hope has disappeared. Let me illustrate it for you. You remember the story of that woman who had a little demon possessed girl in, in Mark, in Mark chapter 7. And, and she was a Gentile woman. And she came to Jesus and said, Jesus, heal my daughter. And, uh, and Jesus said, stand in line and, and take your turn. The children get fed first. You know, If there's any left over, the dogs will get it. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus speaking that way to this desperate mother? Jesus is our only hope. It's only a hope. But, but watch this. The woman said, well, that's the truth, Lord. <laughs> you shouldn't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. In other words, she, she was saying, yes, I'm a dog, even worse than you have said, but all I want, listen, is a crumb, is a crumb from your table, Jesus. And you, re you remember Jesus said, lady, your faith is great. You have what you've asked. Your daughter is healed. What am I saying? I'm saying that many times, God will test your faith. Many times, God will seem reluctant. You can find that all the way 
through the Bible. God seems reluctant, but he's not reluctant. What is he doing? He's proving us. He's testing us. So that's the great question. That's the great question. Point number two. Point number two. The great answer. The great answer. Look with me again in Matthew. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 14 to 16. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Folks, the natural man will never understand the things of God. No, he'll always come up with the wrong answers. So, so he, here's what the disciples said. They said, some say you are a great prophet. Some say you are John the Baptist. Today, some are saying that he's a rabbi. Today, some are saying he's a guru. Today, some say he's a great revolutionary. Today, some say he's a religious reformer. That is what people say. That is what logic says. This is not, but this is not the truth. Logic does not lead to faith. Logic says Jesus is a good man. He's a moral example. He's humanity at his best. Or, 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 some, or someone who, who should be admired. But listen, logic can't save you from your sin. He, hear me well, friend. It's not enough simply to connect Jesus with what logic said or, or even what other people are saying. The majority opinion is often wrong about Jesus. So here is it. Here Jesus asked the disciples point blank, what about you? And by extension, he's asking all of us today, what about you? Who do you say that I am? <laughs> oh, I love this. Because right out of Peter's his mouth comes, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know what? I'm sure he must have grabbed his mouth. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Where in the world did that come from? <laughs> Why do I say that? Because listen to what Jesus said to him. He says, Peter, my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not get this from any man, from any book. You did not learn this from any human being. It's like, it's like God literally opened Peter's mouth and spoke through it. Or, or, or you might say, heaven touched his tongue. I love that. Listen. God is still looking for men and women today to reveal this deep spiritual revelation of who Jesus Christ is. God wants to use your mouth, lady. And God wants to use your mouth, sir. He wants to speak through you at work at the supermarket, at the gym, at school, or, or, or wherever. L let me illustrate it for you. Uh, you know, it's a, a great little story. You know, um, one day a, a teacher asked her fourth grade class this question, said, who, 
who is the greatest human being in, alive in the world today? And the responses came quickly. Uh, a little girl said, oh, I think it's the Pope. <laughs> she said, why? He said, because he cares for, for, for people and doesn't get paid for it all. <laughs> And, and so the kids shouted one celebrity after another until Donnie, this little boy, he spoke up and he said, I think, I think Jesus Christ is the greatest person because he loves everybody and he's always ready to help them. And the teacher uh, told him, oh, Johnny, that answer is okay, but, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the greatest living person. Of, uh, and of course, we know that Jesus lived and died 2,000 years ago. <laughs> to which Donnie replied, Oh no, Mrs. Thompson, that's not true at all. Jesus Christ is alive and he lives in me. He lives in me right now, Mrs. Thompson. Does he live in you? Does he live in you? Can you say that like little Donnie? Folks, Jesus was not just a great man touched by God. He is the Son of God. He's the Son of God. And, and I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this because when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he was saying that he was equal with God. In other words, he was God the Son. He was equal with the Father. He had the power to grant eternal life. Watch this. Watch this. Who has the power to forgive sin? Well, God does. And who has the power to raise people from the dead? Well, God does. Did you know that Jesus did all those things? He, he forgave sin and, and he raised people from the dead. He told people that they would be with him in heaven. He, he claimed to be equal with the Father because he was. He was. When he came to earth, <laughs> God came to earth in flesh and, and dwelt among men. Uh, I, I, I love what the author, author C.S. Lewis, uh, <laughs> He was a former agnostic, you know, and uh, he captured this truth in his book, Mere Christianity. You know, that's a great book to read if you haven't yet. Mere Christianity. And after surveying uh, some of the evidence regarding Jesus' identity, he writes this. And it, the quote is a little long, but I need you to get it. I need you to get it. He says, quote, he says, a man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus says would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be, listen, a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a, is a poached egg or, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice, he said. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else he's a madman or, or something worse. He goes on to say, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. No. He said he did not, he did not leave that up to us. Not something. He did not intend to. End quote. But the Bible also gives us other testimonies of who Jesus Christ is. There's a testimony of, his, of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit declared that He's God. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, The Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
and there's a testimony of the disciples. You see, the early disciples declared that he is God. In, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, John 1 and verse 14 said, The Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Then there's a testimony of the miracles he did. You see, his miracles are proof that he's divine. Can I give you just one? Can I give you one? In John, John chapter 5, you know, John recorded one of the most important miracles that Jesus ever did. There was this man who had been sick for, listen, 38 years. And, and Jesus healed him on the spot instantaneously he healed him completely and he told the man to pick up his bed and to go home which the man did wouldn't you after 38 years but can I be honest with you arriving at the right answer about Jesus Christ is not a flesh and blood thing it's a work of God it's it's a revelation of God. It's a blessing of God. This is what Jesus meant when he said to Peter in, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 17. He says, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. So we've been looking at what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. And so far we've examined, remember, the great question and the great answer. And finally, point number three, and I'm done. Point number three, the great promise. Great promise. Look again with me. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. It's, it says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. That's what the names mean, rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. So Jesus said, I will build my church. Look at this with me. Look at this with me. There is a sense of intimacy there. Jesus says, it is my church. <laughs> it is my church, he said. Then there's a sense of certainty there. He says, I will build my church. <laughs> he is not wavering, you see. He says, I will build. Uh, and there's a sense of invincibility. You know why? Because he says, all the powers of hell will not conquer it, folks. He's building his church today. You see, he purchased it with his own blood. He paid the price. It belongs to him. There are people today who are lambasting the church. Don't do it. You see, the true church is not about the walls and the buildings. No, it's not. The true church is, is, comprom is comprised of everyone who has been baptized by the Spirit, in the Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit. In other words, the only way you can be a member of the true church is to be made alive with the very life of Jesus Christ, bless God. You, you say, Corville, give me a verse, give me a verse of scripture to, to prove that. Here it is. Here it is. First John chapter 5, first John chapter 5 and verse 11 and 12. Say, this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. 
Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Here's what he said. He said, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son, get that? Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. He's talking about spiritual life here. Spiritual life. Watch this. Right now, to declare yourself a Christian in some places, it spells death. You, your head might be chopped off or, or you're burned to death while they film every gruesome detail to energize their social media admirers. Folks, you got to get this. The Bible says that the greatest weapon that Satan's, Satan has in his arsenal is death. And, and after, after he uses his most powerful weapon, there is nothing more than he can do. Nothing more. That is the only thing that he has, the greatest weapon. But listen to what Jesus is saying. He says, <laughs> I am building my church. And the worst that Satan can can do to stop it which is the execution of my people by the most horrible and despicable means that will not overpower it somebody should say hallelujah glory to God so my question to you this morning sir are you a part of the body the church Or are you on the outside bound by sin and you're feeling empty and, and lonely and depressed and frustrated and you're trying to find, you're trying desperately to find meaning, meaning for your life? Lady, are you hungry? Are you heartbroken? I'm just about ready to give up on life. Do you thirst for truth? Are you thirsty? Jesus is, invi is inviting you to come to him and drink. You see, Jesus wants to build you as part of his church today. The Bible calls us, says that we are living stones being built into a spiritual house. He wants to fill your life with joy and hope and meaning. He wants to fill you with himself. Yes, he has spoken. You can believe what he has said. He is God. He cannot lie. He says, I will build my church. But as I close, listen to me carefully, please. He accomplished is his incarnation when he came to earth as a human being. And he accomplished his redemption when he sacrificed his life on the cross for all humanity. He accomplished his resurrection when he rose from the dead on the third day and he accomplished the work so perfectly that God the Father has exalted him to his own right hand and seated him on the throne, bless God. And if he, listen to this, if he accomplish all those other things, I can promise you, he will build his church. And nothing can prevent that. Nothing. Let me tell you something, folks. We need to celebrate Jesus. Amen. We need to celebrate Jesus. He didn't create you and give you and give his life for you, primarily for you to serve him. He made you to worship him and to love him and to know him and, and to enjoy him and for him to enjoy you. You know, the great reformer Martin Luther said, he said, the life of Christianity consists of possessive pronouns. Possessive pronouns. It is one thing to say Christ 
is a savior, it is quite another thing to say, he is my savior and, and my Lord. He said, the devil can say the first, but only the true Christian who is washed in the blood can say the second. Glory to God. Glory to God. Listen, friend. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me ask you this question. Are you tired of the old life you're living? Are you hanging on to prejudices and hates and old mistakes, sins and strife? problems and, and you maybe you have a tongue in your mouth that is like a knife it cuts like a knife why don't why not just give it all to Jesus today can I invite you to pray these words after me from your heart so that you can start afresh with a with a reborn spirit a spirit that is filled with God's life Will you pray with me? Will you pray this prayer with me? Say, Jesus, I believe in my heart that you died for my sins and you were raised from the dead. You were raised to give me new life. I now surrender my life as best as I know how. And I now receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Amen. A question to you today. What does Jesus mean to you? What does he mean to you? You know, the, the phone lines, the prayer lines, they're open. And 416-255-4444, uh, uh, 877 Seven, seven. We'd love to talk with you. This morning, if you're feeling there's an emptiness and you sense it in your, in your life, if you're going through a situation that is way beyond, beyond you, way beyond you, if you're dealing with grief today, grief that is so, that is just grabbing a hold of your emotions and, and you, it won't seem to let you go, Jesus says, bring it to me. Take it to the cross. Bring it to me today. He's waiting on you. Sometimes they say, we're waiting on God. No, God says, I'm waiting on you. Or you can, you can join one of the chat rooms on Facebook or YouTube and, and write us. Write us and, and let us know. Write us and tell us. Tell us what's happening. Tell us what... what it, you say, I, I, you know what? I, I don't know. I, I haven't talk to Jesus in a long time it doesn't matter it doesn't matter he said well I don't know I don't know whether Jesus can help me but you know he said he's God he said he's God and he cannot lie he cannot lie to you and he said listen what he said he says come unto me if you're weary if you're weighed down with issues and problems and circumstances and situations that is way over your head, he says, you come to me, bring it to me. He says, I will give you rest. There's a, another scripture that says, cast all your care on him. Don't carry the care. Cast on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. So give us a call. Give us a call or write to us. We want to hear from you. Let me introduce you to my, to my good friend, uh, Nicole, or Nikki, if ever to be called. Welcome to At The Cross Live again. Thank you, Pastor, for having me back Hello. today. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. It's an honor. It's a pleasure. It's a privilege to be back here this evening with you guys and to discuss today what does Jesus mean to you. Um, me personally, I've had a personal life with Jesus for 50 plus years and what he has become to mean to me is more progressive now over this past three months if you like prior prior Jesus the cross 
signified crucifixion and God died, Jesus dying for our sins. And then what I realized also is that he not only died, when he died on the cross, pastor, for our sins, he did two things. He opened the gateway for all the blessings that we once had to be restored so that when he died, he cleansed my sin and he, and he basically said, Nikki, look, not only is, are your sins forgiven, not only can you come and search me for all your answers, but all the blessings that the Father had in the beginning, you, you now can get. And, and that shut off when Adam, when God first blessed in the beginning and then Adam and Eve messed up like we all messed up. God decided to give us all a second chance by sending Jesus, the second Adam, who then gave his life for us, for all the sins and all the mess that we go through and that we do for us now. So for me, Pastor, knowing that not only are my sins forgiven from the moment I was born to, to the day I die, knowing that, knowing that I can go to my father and say, please forgive me, knowing that I'm blessed and I used to say highly favored, but now I say I'm extremely highly favored. I'm extremely so. Because number one, I'm here with you guys again. And I know that when I take things to my father, when I take things to Jesus, when I say to Jesus, Father, forgive me and in Jesus' name, help me. I know he does. And I know he will. And, and I know that not only from experience, but by reading his words, by, by penetrating it into my life every single day, by knowing that, that God's word can't come back void. So, you, you know, so, so knowing that brings new life to everybody, I feel. And you can't miss a day anymore. Because when you wake up, you know you have new life. You know, you know you're a new creation. You know that you have all the blessings from, the, from birth up until now. You, you know that God is with you. You know that's throughout anything, any trials, no matter what, that he never leaves you, he never forsakes you. And all you have to do is call on him. All you have to do is trust him. And he is right there. Amen. Amen. You know what? Uh, and, and funny you mentioned blessing, and I, and I see that you have a, a book here by, uh, written by one of my favorite people, Marva Tyndale. You know, Martin, the blessing, the blessing, recover your blessing, and and this what, th this is what we do, this is what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to restore the blessing. To restore the blessing, and this morning, you may say, well, you know, I I I feel like my life is cursed. Mm -mm. If it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. I feel like I'm living under a curse. Well, Jesus came. He said, I came to restore the blessing. The yes. blessing that God has meant for you to have. You know, when, when God, the Bible says, when God created man, he says what? He blessed them. He blessed them. No, what, what's a blessing? Blessing is empowerment to succeed. Blessing is the empowerment of God to succeed in life. God doesn't want you to be a failure. You see, when man turned away from God by sinning against God, turned away, then what they turned to was the curse. What's a curse? Because sin brings a curse. And, and maybe, some, maybe somebody this morning that you, you're living a life that, is, that you know it's not right before God. And, and it may be, you find, you know, maybe an instantaneous pleasure. Because the Bible says sin is pleasurable mm -hmm. for a, a while. Yeah, for a while. But then the end of it spells death. Could be death of hope, of your joy, of peace, of meaning in your life. So Jesus Christ came. But and here, here, here's the thing. The Bible says, 
the penalty for sin is death. is death. Death, yeah. This penalty, ultimate penalty is death. But Jesus Christ came and he took, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin in order that we can become the righteousness of God. What's, what's the, what's, what does righteous mean? righteousness mean? It means to be right, to be in right standing with God. And there's nothing you can do to be righteous before God. Nothing you can do. It's true. Jesus has done it all. In other words, he took the penalty of sin on himself at the cross that you and I can receive his righteousness. He never sinned. He looked at his enemies and said, can you, any of you find any sin in me? Any sin. I mean, when he went to John the Baptist to be baptized in the Jordan River, John says, you know, you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. He never sinned. Because if he had sinned just once, he couldn't die for me. He couldn't die for you. He had to die for himself. And how do we know? How do we know that he was perfect? How do we know that he never sinned, that he was righteous? Because God raised him from the dead, bless God. God raised him from the dead proof positive that he was righteous before God. You know, he took that for you, my friend. He took that. And this morning you may say, well, you know what? I, 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 there's something I know. You know, I know that I'm a sinner. I know. I'm not talking about you just make a mistake. You know, sometimes we say, oh, you know what? I make a mistake, but I'm not a sinner. No, I'm not talking about that. No. The Bible says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The fact of the matter is, sometimes we don't want to. We say, oh, it's just a mistake, you know. We're only human. Yeah, we're only human. Yeah, we're only human. But Jesus says, no, you're sinners. And God loved you so much that he came to earth to die on the cross for you. Think of that. Think about it. Think about it. He died in your place that you might receive his life. So he died that you might receive his life. And today, it doesn't matter what it is, what you're going through. If he could have done that for you, then what else wouldn't Jesus do for you? Think about it. But, yes, I, I recognize it. You have to, it takes faith. It takes faith just to trust him. That he can do what he said he, well, he could. But he already accomplished all these other things. There's no other really, you know what? There's no other religious leader. None. No. The, um, that came to this earth, that has walked this earth, that did miracles. Zero. None. The miracles he did. The miracles he did. I mean, blind eyes opened. Dead people raised. If I go to a funeral, there's no, there's not man not coming out of that box anytime soon. You know that there was no person who died in Jesus' presence, not one. No. He said, I am the Prince of Peace. Most, a lot of us now are seeking peace in our lives. You know that while Jesus was on earth for the 33 years that he walked on this planet the Bible says he's the prince of peace for the 33 years that he walked this planet there's not one single recorded war in the history of the world in that in those 33 years so like God was walking here isn't it yeah there's not one single war not one and what's happened since he's left yeah and Look at what's happened. Look at what's happened. You know, there's no, I mean, he took five loaves and two fish. You know, maybe, maybe today 
you 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 you're looking at deficits in your life. Maybe need need. Think of this. Maybe you look at your your bank account and and there's more month than money. There's more month than money. There's maybe there, this maybe today there's not enough to pay the bills that you have. Do you know that Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed five thousand men plus women and children? That's at least fifteen thousand people, folks. Think of that. At least fifteen thousand people. No, where where would you feed in one place 15,000 people in one shot like that. And he took five loaves and two fish and they ate as much as they wanted and he had left over. Like God. In other words, you know, what he can multiply what you have. You say, well, you say, well, what I have is nothing. Well, why not offer it to him and say, Jesus, here it is. It's not enough. Because that even the disciples, they say, Lord, there's, there's 5,000 men here. He says, what do we do with five loaves and two fish? You know what he did? You know what he did? He looked, the Bible says, he looked up to heaven and gave thanks. You know what we do? We curse it. The little we have, we could, oh, this is not enough. You know, I can't take it. It's not enough. It's never enough. What am I going to do? We curse the little. When Jesus got the little, what he did? He blessed it. He looked up to his Amen. father and said, Father, thank you. How many times? Blessed it. How many times you curse the little you have? Mm -hmm. When if you give it to Jesus and Jesus, I hand it over to you. I hand it over to you, Jesus. And Jesus will take that little and make it last. Right throughout the Bible. Th by the way, the Bible is the only religious book, if you will, that has miracles. There's no other one. No other religion has a book, its Bible, that is filled with miracles. From beginning to end. From beginning to end. But I'm saying, the God of the Bible, you can trust him. He loves you. He loves you. I, 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 and you know what? The, the <laughs> There's about four words for love in, in, in Greek. About four words for love. And, uh, and the word that the Bible used, when the Bible talks about the love of God, it, it, it's a word that was never used. The Greek had it, but they never used it because they never believed in it. <laughs> the word's called agape. Agape. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a volitional love. In other words, it has nothing to do with, with the person who is being loved. Nothing. Nothing. They could curse you, you know, beat you up. Doesn't matter. Say all kinds of unkind, unkind things against you. And guess what? You'd still love them. That's the God kind of love. That's the God kind of love. You, you know that the Bible never gives a reason for God to love people, loving people? Never. You look from Genesis to Revelation. He doesn't give a reason. All God says, I love you. That's all. I love you. Why? Because I love you. I love you. I chose to love you. There's nothing. And you know what? There are people today, there's some people today who will die in their sin, Jesus says, and they will go to hell. And guess what? They will go to hell and God still loves them. Because God loved you enough, love you enough that you have your freedom to choose. That's why God doesn't, he doesn't force himself upon you and me. No, he doesn't at all. You say, well, how do I know? Because the reason you're watching today, if you're watching and you see, you, you, we're talking about the love of Jesus Christ, is only because God wants you to watch. Well, he's God. Eh? Nothing with God is accidental. Nothing with God is accidental. It's because he wants you to know that you can make a decision and say, Lord, I choose you. Lord, I choose you. And once you chose him, guess what? He comes in. 
He comes in. The last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, he said, I stand at the door and knock. Listen, Jesus, the doors were closed. Listen, the, the disciples, right after his resurrection, you know, resurrection day, <laughs> The doors are closed. The disciples, they were, they were locked up in a room. They were afraid of the people. You know, they were afraid of Rome. Maybe they're going to crucify us too. The doors are locked. Locked, locked. And Jesus just appeared and stood right in their midst. He didn't need a door. The doors cannot keep him out. No, he's God. Mm -hmm. And yet... That same God would Amen. stand at the door out of your heart this morning. The God that has all power over your life. He's, he could do anything he wants. He could stand, but he stands at the door and he knocks. And he says, if anyone would just open the door to me. Anyone will just open the door to me, he says, I will come in. I'll have a meal with you. I'll give you a drink that you'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. How about it today? How about it? Is that what you need? Do you need a, a drink? Like for instance, the, the woman with the, at, at the well? The woman at the well? She's midday. Nobody goes to the well at midday. It's too hot. But she wants to get away. She's hiding from people. Are you hiding from something this morning? Are you, or today, are you hiding from a past? Have you done something that's, that is hung around your neck for years? You know, like a millstone that nobody else knows? Are you in a new city and nobody else knows what you have? What you've been carrying? That weight you've been carrying? Nobody knows. Has somebody done something to you in your life that is so terrible? And you're bearing all the marks of it. They've gone free, but you're bearing the marks of it. And you desperately want to, to, for it to be removed. Jesus says, I am the way. Just give it to him today. Just give it to him. Just give it to him. You know, uh, somebody says, uh, and uh, there's no name. Uh, somebody says, there, there, there is, please pray for God to guide me and keep me on the straight path. Thank you. You know what? I, I, I have that. If could you give us a name? If you, we'd love to have a name. Just give us a name, you know, and, and where you you where you where you're writing from. We'd love to have it. But could you could you pray for this person for me? Uh, she said she. That's a great. That's a great. Uh, it's a great question. You know. Uh, it says please pray for God to guide me, to guide me and, and keep me on the on the straight path. Could you do that? Father, I ask you this morning, Lord God, to grant the personal guidance in their path, whatever course that may be, Lord God. And Father, I ask you too, Father, that you also bless them. Oh, okay. Bless them with wisdom. Bless them with knowledge. Bless them with the fruits and the works of their hands, Lord God. Be with them in each waking moment of their day. Help them at a night, Father, to also sleep because that is also a gift and a blessing from you. And so many of us, Lord God, suffer from insomnia. So, Father, I ask you that you be with a person, to be with everybody who's on the platform this evening, Father, to help them, to guide them, to protect them during this time, during covid and to be with all the Ontarians right now who are under this current lockdown and stay at home order. Father, my Father, our Father who art in heaven, I ask you now, Father, to be with each and every one of us across this globe, to bless us all with peace beyond understanding, to bless us all, Lord God, and to keep us healthy in our minds, Father, and in our spirits, because that is one area, Lord God, where across the world everything is being hit right now. So, Father, I pray and I ask you, Father, to bless your people with good mental health and to bless them all with peace. 
In Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. 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 You know, um, you know, there, there's maybe, maybe there's, you know, um, uh, Nikki, there's, there's people that are, uh, are having all kinds of questions about Jesus, you know, um, and, and they wonder why, if I just have questions, you know, maybe nobody else, nobody can answer it. But, but it's not, you know, God is not, it's not adverse to you having, having questions. You think, well, if I have questions, and uh, maybe, maybe this morning, maybe, maybe today you have questions about Jesus. You have questions about God. You know, is he who he said he is? Is he who he said he is? And it's not, uh, maybe you've tried to get answers to the questions and, and, uh, and nobody has been, uh, nobody has even uh, given you uh, anything close to what you expect. You know, and, and the truth is that no, none of us have all the answers. No. And if we had all the answers about God, then it wouldn't be God. Think about it. Because just the mere fact that God is, the Bible says God is infinite. Infinite. Think of that. <laughs> I mean, we can't even wrap our, our minds around something that's infinite. We are finite. So just that right there, infinite, an infinite God, has no beginning, no end. Think of it. How could you? How could you have all the answers regarding that? You know, I love what uh, I, I, I love in in you know there's several places in the Bible that it says in in Isaiah and in Revelation. It, it, the Bible says that the angels that surround the throne of God, 24 hours per day, they cry, "Holy, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty." Think of that. Here's something maybe, I don't know if you've ever thought of this. Every minute of every day, every second of every day, they're seeing an aspect of the holiness of God that they've never seen before. And listen, remember, from all eternity. But they're seeing an aspect of the holiness of God that they've never, they didn't know before. And the Bible says they cast their themselves before the throne and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, Lord God, God Almighty. Almighty. It's the Lord God Almighty. What, what I'm saying to you is that he's, he's, we're finite, but He's infinite. There's nothing that He can't do for you. Yeah. There's no situation so that is so wrapped up, so, you know, so tangled. No, none that he can't untangle it. There's none. There's none. And you don't have to know everything about him. You just have to say, Lord, you know what? You can come to him by faith. The Bible says because when you come to him, you must believe that he exists. That's the first thing. You must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of, of those who try those who seek him. That's it. When you seek him with all of your heart. You know, somebody else wrote in and says, is God more powerful? <laughs> ah, that's a good question. Is God more powerful than Jesus? That's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> that's a great good one. <laughs> question. Well, okay. Here it is. When the Bible talks about God, first of all, Let's go back to the beginning. The Bible says, in the beginning, God. The first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God. Right? The word for God there is the word Elohim. Mm -hmm. Elohim. Now, E-L is God. You know, and remember, there's all different kinds of God that, that, uh, that uh, you know, the pagans worship and so forth, and they call E-L, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the word Elohim is plural, like you would say sons, S-O-N-S. It means that there's more than one son that you have. You have more than one son. You have sons. Elohim, I am, it means it's plural. So in, right at the beginning, it says, in the beginning, Elohim. Elohim. So there's a clue there 
that God, you see, it's not just one person, mm -hmm. all right, one person, but more, the first more than one that makes up what's called the Godhead, the Godhead. Because the next verse, it says, and the, the Spirit of God was what? Moving on the waters. So we see right there, this, the God, it says, in the beginning, Elohim. And then this, it said, the Spirit of God was moving. Then it says, it says, God says in, in, in 127, it says, let us make man. Oh, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Are, are, you, are, you, are you getting it? Let us make man in our image and our likeness. So there, there is a, when we talk about God, there's a Godhead made up of the, there's one God, right? Not two, not three. There's one God, but made up, the God is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son. And the Bible says, before Jesus was the name given to him, to the Son, when he came to hurt. Remember, when the angels came, it says, his name will, you will give him the name Jesus. Why? And listen to this, and this is so important here, because, listen to this, because you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people. Oh, my brother, my sister, do you need salvation this morning? You need, you need, to, be, you need to be saved from something. You need to be saved from something so terrible. It could, be, it could be a mental issue that you've had to deal with all your life. He's a savior. He will save his people from this. He got the name Jesus. Before, listen to this, and John chapter 1 and verse 1 tell you, in the beginning was the word. He was simply the word, the word of God, glory to God. The word of God. So, yeah. so when the Bible says, and God said, guess who was saying it? Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because Colossians chapter 1, it tells you that all things were made by him. And without him, nothing that was made that was made. Glory to God. So you say, well, is God more powerful than Jesus? No, no. because Jesus is God. No, when he was on earth, when he came to earth, oh, because he came. Listen what it is. And I love this because... The Bible says that he had to be made like us in every way in order to become a merciful and faithful high priest. So in other words, listen up. So here we are, we're human beings, God made us. So we, 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 we sin, we turned away from him and, 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 and life has been just terrible. We're dying. We're dying because of sin. Because sin brings death. We're dying. And God says, but even before he made us, think of this, even before God made us, he knew when he made us, the God had got together, and we're going to make man. And, but we know man is going to sin, fall away from us, turn their back on us. Well, what are we going to do? And Jesus says, I'll take care of it. No, I'll go. And God the Father says, son, you know what you'll have to do. And the son says, yes, mm -hmm. I'll have to give my life. You see, it was not an afterthought with God. No. The cross was not an afterthought. He knew it, but because of the great love of God and because the Bible says God wanted a family, glory to God, he wanted a family. So Jesus now comes to earth as a man. To ex he couldn't come as God. Think of it. Because he's God, you know. So he came, the Bible says, he had to be made like us in every way in order to become a merciful and faithful high priest. What does a high priest do? A high priest represents God to man and man to God. That's what a, that's what a priest does. Okay? God, man to God and man to God. He's, he's a go-between because we're sinners. So God, the high priest represents us to God and God to us. So he came to fulfill that. But he came. God, you see, God didn't bleed. He doesn't know what it is to bleed. Does God know what it is like when, you're, when, you, when your spouse tells you, I don't love you anymore. I found, I found a younger version of you. Mm -hmm. does, the, does God know that, what it feels like? Does God know what it's like when I have no money and they're about to evict me? Are they going to repossess my car? <coughs> no. So he came, 
in a human being as a human being. And the Bible says in, in Philippians chapter 2, listen what he said. He says, he who was God, right? And, and I'm paraphrasing. He says, he did not consider equality with God something to be to grasp and to hold on to. Mm -hmm. But he made himself nothing. Remember, he's walking, he's on a throne in heaven. The streets is paved with gold. The streets are paved with gold. He came here, made himself nothing. And subjected himself to death. The worst death that human beings could ever, ever thought of. Death on a cross. Death on a cross. He subjected himself to that. So you and I can't say, Oh, God doesn't know what I'm going through. He doesn't understand. You and I could never say that. He doesn't know. No. He experienced life in everything as a man. Mm -hmm. He came as a human being. No other God in the history of the world. There's no other religion in the history of the world that says that. That their God became man. Their God don't want to become man. They want to become man. To experience everything that you experience and when he says to you I understand it's true when he says to you I understand so yes when he came the Bible says he laid aside his deity actually he was still God while he was here because then guess what he couldn't only God can forgive sin man can forgive sin like if I sin against you I can ask you for forgiveness that's it I can ask you for forgiveness but how about somebody else or, or, or Nicole here? You couldn't say, well, I forgive, you forgive me for sinning against somebody else. No. Nope. You can't say that. No. no way. You can't say that. You forgive me for sinning against somebody else. Gee, only God can do that. That's what Jesus did. <laughs> he said, he forgave me for sinning against you. Only God can do that. So he, when he forgave sin, he acted as God. Oh, what, but that, what, that, what was that to do? To save you, to free you, glory to God. To free you. To set you free. So Jesus, he laid aside his deity. He, 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 in other words, like what? He enveloped his power. The power is deity in human flesh. In human flesh. There's one time, the Bible says, it's written in the Gospels, that he let it show just for a moment when they were on with the three disciples mm -hmm. on Mount of Transfiguration. When the Bible said he shone like that, brighter than the sun. He shone brighter. He said light. I mean, because the Bible says what? God is light. 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 God is light. For a moment, the disciples saw it. That's why Peter said in Second Peter, he said, he says, we're not telling you fables. We saw him. We saw the coming of the Lord. We saw it. We saw his power for just a moment. We couldn't take it. He said they, were, they, they, they fell on their feet. They were afraid, of course. Yeah. Yeah. He did it for you. He said, yes. The question was, is Jesus... Uh, is God more powerful than Jesus? No. Jesus is God. He is God. You know, when he came to earth, the Bible says he, he laid aside his power to identify with us. He went back to heaven. And one day he's coming back. One day he's coming back. He's not coming any longer to bear sin. This is what he says. He says he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. Glory to God. Hallelujah. There is a, there is a time. That, uh, uh, Nikki, there's a time in, in Revelation. The Bible says, uh, you know, judgment. God's bringing judgment on the earth during the great tribulation. Judgment. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that, uh, that he... Uh, that, that John says the, the seal, there's a, a seal, there's a, a scroll with a seal. And, 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 and the, the question is asked, who is worthy to open the seal? Who is worthy? Revelation chapter 5, who is, who is worthy to open the seal? Uh -huh. and, the, and, and the Bible says no one was found worthy. No one was found worthy to open the seal. And uh, the, yeah, no one. And the Bible says that, that, that John, 
the revelator, John, who is writing the revelation, he says, he, John says, I started to weep because nobody was found worthy to open the seals. Nobody. Nobody. And he said, the angel said to him, John, don't weep. He says, see the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is worthy to open the seals. He's worthy to do it. He's okay, John. Don't, don't cry. You don't have to cry. And John says, I turn to look at this lion of the tribe of Judah. And when I turned to look, John said, I did not see a lion. I saw a lamb. Look, it's at his, at, it has been slain. Glory to God. In other words, I tell you, to the enemies of God, the enemies of Jesus, when they see, they see a lion. Glory to God. But to you and me who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we look to him, when we come to the, to the throne of grace to get something our needs met, when we come to have to say, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need it. Lord, I'm sick in my body. Lord, let my, my account be some. Lord, my kids have gone. Lord, my, my spouse has left me or whatever it is. You don't see a lion. You see a lamb. A lamb looking Amen. as if it had been slain. Bless God. You see a lamb looking as if it has been slain. He doesn't want you to, to, to be a lion to you. To your enemies, yes. But to you, he doesn't want you to have. That's why, you know, and I, and I follow this up with you. That's why. You know, my brother, my sister, if you're having, if you're a Christian today and you're having issues to deal with, the last thing before the Lord, or last ordinance he left, and the only one he left us with, is, 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 to, is, is to take communion. You know what? He says, because hear what the Bible says, take a piece of bread and a piece of, uh, and some water, if we will, or whatever it is, and read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22 to 25. Because he says, he said, every time you take this, you, you eat this bread or drink from this, he says, you remember my death until I come. Amen. Amen. John, the revelator, didn't see a lion. All he saw was a lamb. It was a lamb. He doesn't want to... Satan prowls around like a roaring lion. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking he who he can devour. Star. Amen. But the your cross. Christ that died on the cross for you, Stands in defense. he doesn't want you to see a lion. Amen. He wants you to see a lamb. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He doesn't want Hallelujah. you to be afraid of him. He says, come unto me. You know what? They check the English language and they say, which is the most beautiful word in the English language? Which is it? They took, they took a survey. Which is the most beautiful word? You know what the most beautiful word is? Come, the word come, come, come. Jesus said, come to me. If you're weary, if you're heavy laden, come. Hallelujah. Come, I Hallelujah. died for you. What else won't I do for you? So it's a, it's a long way, but I, I need you to see, to, to get from the beginning of of why when, when we talk about Jesus and who he is yes <laughs> yes could I tell you something right now in the Godhead you remember I talk about the Godhead Father Son and Holy Spirit remember Jesus the Son the second member of the Godhead you remember he came to earth as Jesus got the name Jesus he's still Jesus there right now in other words in the Godhead glory to God ha huh? there's a man sitting on the Godhead Hallelujah. because Paul said Paul said to Timothy to his protege Timothy he says there's one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus he's still a man today my brother my sister he's still a man he'll always be a man in the Godhead there's a man mm -hmm. the Godhead there's a man a man who understands you a man who knows you. A man who gave his life for you. Hallelujah. He's still there. He's still a man. He's still a man. Uh, I, 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 got, I got to read this. I hope that I hope that answer your question. <laughs> but I got to read. It says, um, it says, Celia in, in Niagara Falls, uh, Lord, help us. You learn your God. Help us learn your God. There is no substitute. We must listen to you. God more powerful uh, to you. God more powerful than Jesus. 
No, th that's why we just explain. <laughs> no, <laughs> he's God. There's nobody. He's God. He's God. <laughs> he's God. You know, he's no longer veiling. It's, it, his power, his glory is no longer veiled. It's no longer veiled in mm -hmm. flesh. No. Ah, because when he rose from the dead, he, rose, he had a body. It was a I spiritual know. body. It had, it had flesh and bones. Yes, you can touch it and feel it because that's what he said to the disciples. Feel me, touch me. I'm not a ghost. He said, feel me, touch me. But there was no blood. It, it, his blood was shed. His blood was shed completely at the cross. It's now a spiritual body. It's an eternal body. It was sown by, in, in, you want to know about it? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and you get it. Oh God, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was sold. It was a mortal body. It was sold. And then it was raised an immortal body. Glory to God. And you know what? What I love is that in the end, that's the same body we will have. Amen. Because the Bible says when we see him, we will, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. Glory to God. And, um, and Jack in BC said, Lord, we must learn you are who you are. Help us to learn and understand you are God. Hallelujah. And Carmen in Toronto, she said, the truth shall make us free. That's the truth. Amen. <laughs> I, I tell you, Nikki, the truth is only truth that make us free. Yes, it is. Only truth that make us free. Sometimes, sometimes, you know what? We, are, we have stuff we're going through. We have stuff we're going through all the, well, all the time. We have stuff that we're going through. And, and we want to solve it. And we get sometimes people's opinions. You know, and, and that's not all. Sometimes they're opinions. And opinions can be, you know, some people, they're sincere when they give us their opinions. But sometimes they, are, they can be sincerely wrong. And, and, and so if we follow those opinions, then the end of it spells death. Because the way that the, the Bible says the, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end mm -hmm. thereof is death. It seems right, but the end it spells death. But Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. John 17, 17 says, thy word is truth. Amen. John 8, 32 says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Only truth sets us free. Only truth sets us free. So how do you know when it is the truth, Pastor? Well, you know what? How do you know that? Well, that's a great question because it must line up. Truth, it must line up with God. It must line up with what God has said. It has to line up with what God has said. Because he says, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. For instance, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> for instance, uh, uh, there's a, let's say a young lady. She, she wants to get married. She thinks we're good. The clock is ticking and, and she wants to get married. All right? uh, but uh, she loved God. She loved God. And no question about that. She loved God accepted Jesus Christ mm -hmm. as Lord and Savior, but there's, in the natural, she wants to get married, or clock is ticking, she'd like to have a family, but it doesn't seem to be happening. But here, somebody comes along, and he, he, he's a church goer. He's a church goer. Never really accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's a ch he goes to church. He mm -hmm. goes to church. And then, and then, um, and then y y you know, he starts to court her. But somewhere in her spirit, something is not quite right. Not but right. after all, he goes to church. So that's, mm -hmm. that's okay, he goes to church. You know, it's not quite right at all. Because in all of this, guess what? He wants, during the relationship, he even wants her to go beyond just courting. He would want the, her to go beyond to have sex during that time. Now, so he's trying to push her out. Uh, ah, to she get her to do something that goes against, against what the Bible says. And the Bible is not against sex. Sex is something that God created. So he's not, God's not against it. He must be in a nifty mood when he created sex, but he, God created sex. But the, he created it for man. For he created it to be done in a, 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 like in, in a context, the context of marriage. It's just like to, if you travel the train, Mm -hmm. That you don't see a train on the highway. A train is built to remain on the track. That's it. 
That's where it's built to remain on the track. That's where it does its best work on tracks, okay? The, the same thing. So here is, he's trying now to get her to do something that goes against what God has said. Now, you know what? The fact of the matter is that how do you know, how does she know whether she should, uh, she should, she should give in or not? Because he's pouring love upon her. He's pouring all kinds of love upon her. He's buying her this. He's buying her flowers and whatever. And, and he's even telling her, if you love me, we're going to get married in the, in the long run anyways. You know, let's, let's, we just see whether we're, listen to this. Listen to this half truth or lie. We just see whether we are compatible. Okay. We, we, we just see whether we are compatible, folks. Well, let me ask but you this question. If Pastor. it doesn't, but it doesn't line up with this. No. No, she has a decision to make. She has a decision to make. Is she going to stay with truth and say, you know what? You're not for me. How is she going to say, okay, gonna, the word is called compromise, her faith, and, and, and what she knows to be truth. And the minute you do that, you start on a path to death minute she does that. She starts on a path down the road because only truth can set you free. Only truth can set you free. Yeah, you were asking. How many women, girls, have chosen between the love of, the, of a man over the love of God? True. And as you say, the man's telling you and showering you with gifts and saying all these things. And then he goes against the word where God told you. Yeah. You have to keep yourself yeah. until you're married, till yeah. the two became one, because that's a sacred yeah. union. Yeah. And then what happens to the girl who gives herself in, in lies, because the man has given her lies, but she accepted it as truth. Mm -hmm. And now she's given herself. Two months li down the line, he, bye-bye. 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 Yeah. And then he goes and tells all his friends and, yeah. you know, her name is now put all over yeah. the place. How does she now go forward? You know what? That's a great question. It's a great question. You remember Jesus Christ is a savior? A savior? The Bible says God is not just a savior. God restores. You know, um, I tell you, we all have a, sp we have a, a, a physical life and we have a, a natural life, a, 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 a not physical natural life, and we have a spiritual life toward us. We're not just physical, we are spirit. We have a spirit within us, and we have a soul. What's your soul? Your soul is your intellect, your will, and your emotions. So we have a spirit, we have a, and, and we have a soul, and the spirit and the soul dwells in this physical body. You see, one of the things why Jesus, you know, you hear what the Bible says. The Bible says God looked at Jeremiah, the, a prophet, and he says, before you were born, I knew you. So what did God know? It had to be in the spirit, because remember, spirit are eternal. Your spirit, your spirit in you now is eternal. <laughs> yeah, your soul is eternal. Just the, it's just a body that will die. Your spirit and your soul can die. So here, here it is, is that, with a, uh, I call it a young, and it could be a young man also, it doesn't really matter, is that you've done something that goes against what God has said. You know what? Hear what the Bible says. Because Jesus Christ came on the cross and, and died. So all sin has been paid for, every, both past, present, and future. future. All yeah. sin, period. Because remember, remember, God is infinite. God is eternal. So anything God does is eternal. Anything God does is eternal. All right? So listen, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it wasn't just for now. It go away, went all the way back to Adam and all the way forward for eternity. His blood, you see, the blood Jesus had was, it was God's blood. Oh, here's something. Here's something. <laughs> You know what? If you want to check a baby's uh, the paternity, you don't check the mother, the mother's blood. The baby doesn't have the mother's blood. The baby has the father's blood. You see, 
<laughs> with, a, with a baby, <laughs> when, a, when a woman is pregnant mm -hmm. with she a baby, the baby doesn't get the blood from the, from the mother. The baby gets the father's blood. There's no blood that passed through the placenta. No, there's only nutrients, not blood. Not blood. So he, he, here is this. When Jesus shed his blood, it was God's blood. You remember? The angel said to Mary, the, the, the Holy Spirit, who is God, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Hallelujah. So that that which is to be born, right, will be called the Son of God. <coughs> so it's God's Son. It's God's Son. So, so when, the, hear what the Bible says, okay. So all sin, when he died, all sin for all eternity is, is forgiven. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to heaven. No, because listen, you can only, you have to receive it. You have to receive it. It's a gift. A gift can only be enjoyed if you receive the gift. That's the only way to enjoy a gift, any gift. All right? You have to receive it. But it's there. But here it is now. Here it is. So you've sinned, and you know you've done. The Bible says, if you confess, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin, and listen to this, to cleanse you, to cleanse you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, when you, you recognize that you, may, that you did wrong, you, you've sinned, you sinned. You, say, you come to God and say, God, you know, Lord, I sinned. I gave this man or this woman what should not be given to them until we, 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 we come into covenant, the covenant relationship. God, I sin. Like David, you, you would say, it's against you and you, Lord, that I've sinned. He didn't say I made a mistake, you know, I, I just stubbed my toe. No, God, I sinned. I call it what it is. I call it what it is. I sin. And the Bible says, the minute you do that, you're restored. Amen. The minute you do that, you are restored. Glory to God. You're restored. The minute you do that. So you can, and if you've done that, if you're going through that right now where you've done that, where you've recognized you were a Christian and you recognize that you, you, you've sinned, you recognize that, you can come to God and just release it to Him and say, Lord, I've sinned. Forgive me, oh God, forgive me. And the Bible says, it's done. It's done. Why? You know why? It's not because you're a good person. It's not because God loves you. It's not because God loves you why He forgives your sin. It's not. Why? Because God can't forgive you that way. God can forgive out only one purpose, one reason. Because Jesus Christ died. Because somebody must die. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Somebody must die. Somebody, you know, in the natural, I come to God and say, God, I confess it and God forgives. But what it really, what, what happens is that God take that sin and put it under the blood because under the blood can wash it. Hallelujah. Love can't wash Hallelujah. sin away. Time can, he said, well, time does all things. Time cannot wash sin away. That's why you can carry a curse for generations. It's a sin. And it passed on for generations. You can catch for generations in your family until the blood of Jesus Christ. It meets the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's where it stops. Hallelujah. That's where it stops. Because only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse sin. My brother, my sister, it's not time that cleanses it. That's why some of us, we, we, some things that happened to us when we were little, little kids, little kids, maybe molested mm -hmm. as a little child. Yes. And you remember, and you wonder why you can't step over it. You, you, you've now made something of yourself. You've now have degrees. Maybe you've gone to the pinnacle, and you've had your PhD. And everybody sees you. And they want to have a life like yours. You say, this is made. And she, she's made. I mean, she's done so wonderfully. 
and somewhere in the back of your mind, you can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's there. You can't get rid of it. And some people, the enemy comes. Remember, lion. he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who, can he, who he can devour. And he comes around and he said, you think you're something, but you're nothing. But I can tell you how you can get rid of that. Kill yourself. He tells you, kill yourself and you'll get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's a lie. Because my, son, my brother, my sister, all that does is that you enter eternity without your sins being forgiven. It's a lie. Jesus says he's a liar. He's a father of lies. But the minute you come to Jesus and say, Hallelujah. and there's somebody watching this morning, I don't know who you are, but you know who you yes. are. You know who you are. Somebody's watching, and you've carried, you've been, you've carried around a sin that somebody perpetrated against you. You know, Maybe it's not you. Maybe we all sin against each other. But you're carrying that around. And Jesus is saying, today is your day. Today is your day. Call one of the people. Call the phone lines, whatever. Or call one of, the, one, one of the, the people in the chat rooms. They're there for you. And they'll pray with you. They will pray with you. They'll pray with you. Because only the blood of Jesus can cleanse that sin. Only blood Hallelujah. can, without the shedding of blood, there's no... You see, we, we think, well, God, because God is loving, God can save. God can't save you that way. If he could, then Jesus Christ died for nothing. You see, the Bible says God is love. So he's always love. He's always been loved. He's always will be loved. He can't save you that way. Mm -mm. Something must die. Hallelujah. Something must die. Something must die. And Jesus Christ died. He died. Uh, you know, Carmen in Toronto says, the truth shall make us free. That's, that is true. This, this is, by the way, so long as we agree, this is truth. This is truth. Line up your life with this. It's like building your life on the rock. Building your life on God's word. It's building your life on rock, bedrock, bedrock. Carol says, Carol says, Corville, thank you for your sound words of advice and, and Bible quotes, which have helped me immensely. Thanks for our loving God as well. You know, uh, Carl would be, Carl, thank you so much. Thank you for your kind words. But you know what? I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on this. <laughs> I, I'm flawed. I'm flawed, like we all are. But you know what? I come to the Lord. I say, Lord, here it mm -hmm. is. I missed it here. I, I, I missed it, Lord. I missed it. Oh, Lord, yes. I... You know, uh, you know how many times, and God says, "Son, you know, <laughs> son, I love you. Son, I love you. I love you. That's it. That's it." Carmen in Toronto said, "Thank you for, for thank you, Lord, for loving me. It's true. That's all we. You know what? If you're a Christian, you know one thing you do each day. The Bible says, hear what it is. The Bible says we must pray." We must pray mm -hmm. to God. That's the only way to communicate with God. Pray. Through prayer. But sometimes we come to God in, uh, and we just mount off prayer. God, it's a long list we have. You want to know something? And, and, and sometimes we go away and wonder why nothing is happening. And, uh, you hear what it says. First of all, the Bible says, Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. In other words, Come when you when you when you come to God, enter the gates with Lord. I'm so thankful to you mm -hmm. that I that I have life. I, uh, I wake up this morning, God. I'm so thankful that you kept me through the night. You know, do you know like you, you, you're like a, you're like a dead person. You're not aware of anything that's going on around you uh, when you're sleeping. You're not aware of anything. So who keeps you? Who kept your heart from pumping? Who kept you? Who kept all your heart from pumping and all that? Who kept you breathing? It was God. It's God. Your, your life. You, you remember the Bible says, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. Listen to what Paul said. It says, it says, in him we live and move and have our being. You see, God is always God. He will always be God. Listen, everything that happens in this world, he's in control. Hallelujah. He's in control of it. <laughs> yeah. 
So he's kept you breathing. Even though you don't acknowledge him, mm -hmm. this is his kingdom. Amen. <laughs> I mean, this, 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 this piece of rock belongs to him, called earth. Belongs to him. Called. The Bible says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness Amen. thereof. Amen. Belongs to him. He'll not give it up. I want to tell you this. You know, people are afraid that, you know, the nuclear war and all that. So I'm not mm -hmm. afraid of it. You know, nobody can destroy this. This belongs to God. It belongs to him. He made it. He created it. You can't do it. You can't destroy it. No. You can't destroy it. Glory to God. It belongs to him. He's sovereign over everything. So, so what? When you come to him, you come to humbly, and you come thanking him. Lord that God, thank you that I can even pray to you. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Find something to thank him for. Thank him. If you say, well, I have nothing to thank him for the breath that you breathe. The breath that you're breathing. And the Bible says, when you come into the courts, it says, come into the courts with praise. You start to praise him. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I glorify you. Lord, there's no God like you. I'm so thankful there's, there's no God before you. And there's no God coming after you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love me. You love me, me, God. I can't even believe that you'd love somebody like me. But you love me, God. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? And sing a song. You know, keep sing a song of praise. Praise him, whatever. Sing a song of praise to him. And then before you start mouthing off what your needs are. Remember, the Bible says that he knows what you need, need before, before you even ask, ask him. <laughs> so so why, does you why do you pray? Why do you pray? Why do you pray? You know what? <laughs> it's called fellowship. It's called communication. <laughs> if you ever have... You need to have kids, and you know, you know, and sometimes when they get to teenager and they go into their room and they lock up, they lock themselves away and they don't want to talk to you, you know. And it, 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 when you talk to them, the only thing you can hear sometimes is a grunt, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a grunt, and and you would want them to talk to you. Well, think of think of God, your Father. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> he wants to talk to you. He does. He wants to talk to you. My brother, my sister, he wants to talk to you. So that's how, that's how you come to him. That's how you come to him. You know, um, you know, Nikki, is that, but all of us make mistakes, you know, and uh, we need to grow because the relationship with God is a relationship and we need to grow in that relationship. And as we read his word, as we read his word, we, we grow into it. And that's why we, that's why every day, every day, every single day, every single day, we go into the. Earth. Let me ask you this: Do you have a, do you have a, like a, a, a set way every day that you meet with God yourself, and why? When I wake up every morning, the first thing I do is thank God that He actually woke me up. I thank Him for for the day and what he's about to do in it. I ask him that I be a blessing to other people as they are blessings to me. And I ask him to guide me throughout that day. I, I give that day, my day to him to use because I am his too, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. I, I, when I was younger, I used to go to God and ask him for things, right? Because it's gimme, gimme, gimme. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. As as we mature, we realize that it's a two-way street, right? And God deserves God. God requires worship from us. God requires a communion and a relationship from us. God requires us to see Him uh, as the provider, mm -hmm. uh, as our lover, as everything. Not to look to man for things, but to look to him first. Mm -hmm. And once you grasp that, then waking up every morning and saying, thank you, Father. What are we doing today? Do you know what I mean? What, what, what mm -hmm. we're doing, what's off, right? Makes it even more exciting. Because the day is not about you. It's about what you and him's going to do together. Mm -hmm. So when you know you've got God on your side, and you know what I mean, yeah? 
you're going to work with God. I mean, I, I'm a little bit jealous that I wasn't around when God was was on earth, right, in the pillar of fire, because I'd have been right up there, you know what I mean, getting warm. But now we've got to generate some of that from ourselves through prayer, through communion with each other, um, through blessing each other, through, through listening to your program, right, through getting us fed as much as we can so that every day when we wake up, we seek him. So that every night when we go to bed, we thank him for taking us through all the day, for, for all the things that we go through. I mean, I, I'm, I'm laughing and I'm so full of joy mm -hmm. because I know I'm blessed. Do you know what I mean? I know that I'm loved. Mm -hmm. And a few months ago, yeah, I, I'm married. I've been married 20 years and I know my husband loves me. But to know that God really loves me and, and I'm so special to him and, and that I had a purpose and, and that I have a purpose and that together we're going to get to it is just absolutely not just a blessing. It, it's just, a, it's an anointing, it's an appointment mm -hmm. that you're mm -hmm. running to, right? It's, it's, you get up every morning and it's like, yes, let's go. What are we going to do next? Whereas, I don't know, I, I feel sorry for people who, who, don't, who don't have a relationship with, with God, who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus like I do. Because I, I have had the same pressures and, and problems of everybody else. But I just wake up knowing and trusting God that God's got me. And that's the difference. Yeah. Well, 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 there's, there's something this Monty, Monty is calling line three. Uh, hello, hello, Monty. Yes. The, Monty, Hi, sir, thank you, know. you, thank you so much for, for, for calling at the Cross Live. Another uh, great show, and just a brief answer to what does Jesus mean to me? Yes. He is my rock and my redeemer and my Savior who promises me eternal life. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 And let me ask you this, Monty. Yes. How, how do you keep, because we know uh, when uh, if in a wife and husband situation, we know we need to keep the, the, the relationship kind of fresh, you know, and how do you keep the relationship fresh between you and Jesus? How do I do that? Yes. Well, I keep getting myself into different kinds of situations <laughs> that I am no longer able to handle myself. And so in my surrendering to the Lord, He keeps in pretty good constant contact with me, <laughs> yes. helping me along uh, to fulfill His will for me in this yes. life. Yes. You know, uh, the Bible says every day, uh, I, I want, one thing I, I love about our God, it says every day for us has been written down in His book before yeah. one of them comes mm -hmm. to be. So in other words, God is not making this thing up as no. He goes along. He has, everything is all planned. Everything is all planned. And, and uh, you know, sometimes, especially now when we look, with, with COVID, you know, right. and uh, with, with COVID, and we say, this is a worldwide pandemic. Mm -hmm. If somebody ever told us a year and a half ago that this would Didn't happen, it. we'd say no. We'd say, what are you smoking? But it's true. <laughs> but <laughs> every, everything is, 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 is according to plan. God is not causing this, did not cause the worldwide pandemic, but I tell you something, he's certainly using it for his glory because, uh, you know, I didn't, I never knew about uh, Zoom no. before all of this. Nobody no. ever heard about Zoom before no. all of this. And guess what? If now God is using this when, when the, the buildings of the church, the place the church meets is closed, but I tell you that the, the, as Paul says, the, the word of God is not, is not uh, you can't put it on the wraps. No way. No way. The word of God. So it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. But, but Monty, uh, uh, are you reading your Bible? I am, and I have some trouble with my eyesight. So okay. I have the Bible on MP3. Ah, I love that. I can to yes, it. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I just go back and 
and my mantra almost is Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. When I, yeah. I encourage your listeners to look that up, Philippians 4, yes. 6 and 7. Yes, yes. Because not to worry, but to take our care yes. and give them to him. Yes, yes. With thanksgiving, yes. and he will work things out and yes. give us Yes. In our mind and yes. Body and soul. Yes. In in other words, in other words, just just bring it to him in prayer and just trust him, and so and and he may not come when you want him to, but he's never late. You know, he's never. You know, it it sounds almost cliche, but it's it's always fresh. It's always fresh, and uh, you know, it, it, it is God. He's God. My brother, uh, God. They, they're, they're telling me I gotta go. I gotta run. But thank you so much for calling and and give us a call back and let us know how you're doing. Will Please. Do. I just had a nice prayer from Martha before I got on here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't she wonderful? I locked out with her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I married up. Eh? So <laughs> I locked out with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for some And God bless you, my brother. God bless you. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah, it's true, you know, and, and, and I tell you, we, you know, we've been talking about the God and you, ha you need to come into relationship with him, come into relationship with him, and, and, and right now you can. C could I just, you know, and you say, well, Corbin, how do I do it? You know, just by talking to him, praying to him. Right now, would you just pray this prayer with me? Would you just pray this prayer with me? Uh, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I don't quite understand it. I, I don't even know my Bible. But I believe that you exist. Lord, will you make yourself real to me? Just real. And Lord, I believe you died and you rose again from the dead. I, I now surrender my life as best as I know how. Lord, will you cleanse me of my sin? Yes, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. And, and if you pray that prayer, you know, could you just give us a, give us a line, drop us a line on, your, on the website at thecrosslife.com. It's there at the bottom of the screen. Just, just drop us a line and tell us. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll contact you. We'll contact you. You know, God loves you. You know, that's not accidental. Wherever in the world you are, because this is going all across the globe, wherever in the world you are, drop us a line and let us know. I, I gave my life to the Lord. I, I gave my life to the Lord. All right? Thank you so much. And you'll find your life... <laughs> ah, some things you thought you could never live without. If somebody paid you, you wouldn't do them anymore. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you thought you could never live without it, but somebody paid you, now you wouldn't do it. Why? Because God comes in. The Bible says when we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. God himself, God the Spirit comes to live within us. So you're not on, you're not on your own. You're not out there to you know in a boat without a paddle. No way. He's there. He's in the boat. He's in the boat. Uh, and uh, my sister, you know, so glad you, so glad you, you could join us. So glad. Thank you, you know for what? Inviting we got, me. we got less, a bit, a minute Let's and see. a half. Could you, in a minute, could you, in a minute, just, just say to somebody that they need Jesus, and Jesus is their answer. Guys, right now, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life, because God knows it. And right now he's just waiting for you to say, I accept you. And that's all it is. Jesus, forgive me. I give my life to you. Use me. Here I am. Simply done. Simply. Simply done. That's so simple. And it's simple. The gospel simple. is simple. <laughs> the gospel is simple. The gospel is simple. You know what? And what she said, it's true. It's, that's all you got to say. Lord, here am I. You are mine, and he will take it from there and help you 
will help you. Now, I, I just want to bless you before I go. Say a blessing over you before I go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine Shut upon you and be gracious you. unto you. The Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and the Lord Himself give you shalom, peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Till next time, bye-bye.